moment that stole the breath from your lungs? Have you ever found yourself grasping for words to articulate the mess of your past, present, and future? What songs rise from the broken pieces of your heart as a testament that you are still breathing? This is the human story, brimming with joy, grief, war, peace, doubt, and belief. Each of us has a human story, but we also have a God story within us. He is the breath in our lungs, the words on our page, the companion in our desert, the melody of our song, the salvation of our soul. We are human because He is God. What's up, church family? Who's excited to be here today? Come on. Let's go. I'm fired up. If you're new with us here today, my name is Pete. I have the honor of serving as the lead pastor. I know it's been a few weeks since I've been in the pulpit. Uh, I want to say a huge thank you to pastors Beth, Rich, and Jordan for uh, stepping in these last three weeks and sharing with us what God has laid on their hearts. I trust that you were encouraged and that your faith was built by those messages I want to start today's installment of this series by asking a question that was made famous by the head coach of the Buffalo Bills from their Super Bowl years, Marv Levy. Uh, Those of you that are younger may not even know who he is, and that makes me feel old, but he used to say this question quite often, and as soon as I start to say it, some of you are going to be able to say it with me. Where else would you rather be than right here, right now? Come on, come on, Who's, who would you, how many of you would rather be anywhere else than right here? Now, some of you hear that question, you're like, hmm, there's a whole lot of places I could be right now. That would be pretty cool. I don't know, maybe your mom or dad dragged you here this morning, and you would rather be on a beach, you'd rather be on vacation, maybe you'd rather be in bed still sleeping. I don't know. Maybe you are here out of ritual or duty. And so, and if you're honest, maybe you don't especially enjoy coming to church, but you come because you feel like you're supposed to or because it's the right thing to do. Or maybe you're here and you're somebody who has walked through or experienced some church hurt. And even the fact that you are in this room today might be considered a small miracle because just being in a setting like this is triggering because it it brings back painful memories of things that you've walked through in the past. And Can I just give props to you for coming back to church to check it out? Because here's one thing I know about the way God works. When you're wounded in community, you will be healed in community. God's house, his people are always meant to be in relationship with one another. And though you may not be healed in the same community that you were wounded in, make no mistake that you have to be in community to be healed. Maybe you're here today because you're searching. You're searching for something. You're not sure what yet, but you're on a quest to find truth, to find answers, to find meaning or purpose. And if that's you here today, you might not even know how you feel about being here. Maybe you're a little nervous. Maybe you're a little suspicious or skeptical. But can I just commend you for having the courage to walk through the doors, to learn a little bit more about who this Jesus is. And I know that our prayer for you on staff and our dream team is that you would experience the very real presence of Jesus and that you would taste and see just how good he is. I know a lot of you might not know how you feel about being here today, but for those of you who are blood-bought, redeemed, sons and daughters of God, I hope you are here today because you love being in God's house, worshiping Jesus gathering together with his people. Pastor Beth in week two encouraged us to make Jesus the number one thing we desire more than every other thing. And here's what I know will happen when you make that decision to make Jesus the number one thing you pursue. His Holy Spirit begins to cultivate new desires and new loves in you. When you're seeking Jesus more than every other thing, you're gonna start to love his word, which Pastor Rich talked about in week three because his word is how he speaks to us. You're gonna start to love his people. These crazy bunch of people called Christians. These are your brothers and sisters in this new spiritual family that you've been grafted into. And you're gonna start to love his church. You're gonna start to love being in church because here's what I know. It says that when God's people gather together, he inhabits the praises of his people. 
And when God's presence shows up, amazing things can happen. You'll love his church because church is where you get to be fed through the preaching of his word. Church is a place where you can hear God speak to you, not only through his word, but through other people. It's where we get encouragement and fellowship with other believers and where we get to encourage other believers ourselves. Church is a place where God is exalted and people are drawn to him. Church is a place where miracles happen, where people find hope and healing and forgiveness and freedom. I hope you love coming to church. I hope it's the highlight of your week. I hope you miss it when you can't attend. Now, whether that's how you feel today or not, because I know we're all at different places in our spiritual journey, But what I want to talk about today is that how when church is the way it's supposed to be, it's a place that people are excited to attend. And if you're new here today, I think you can probably tell already by now that we get a little bit excited about worshiping our king. Now, when I talk about church, I'm not talking about like just showing up on Sunday and faking a few smiles and half-heartedly singing a few songs while you suffer through a long-winded sermon. I know you've never thought that before. That is not what church is meant to be. When church is the way it's supposed to be, it is the best possible place to be. But I also believe that what you get out of church depends on how you approach church. If you come thinking that church is gonna be boring, guess what? It's probably gonna be boring. But if you come with a heart full of faith and expectancy and excitement, believing that God is gonna move, guess what? He will meet you where you're at. Now, I want to help all of us today develop a greater sense of longing and excitement for the house of God by looking at one of my favorite psalms in the book of Psalms, Psalm 84. Psalm 84 does not actually talk about the church per se, uh, but that's because when the psalm was written, the church did not exist yet. Psalm 84 is actually talking about the temple, which is similar to the church, but the temple was the place where Old Testament saints used to go to worship God. And so while this psalm is specifically talking about going to the temple to worship, we can kind of bring this into our modern context and say that it's about going to church. Now, before we look at the psalm, I want to let you know that this, was, this is something known as a song of pilgrimage. See, every year, Jews, no matter where they lived, were required at least once a year to make a trip and travel to Jerusalem to worship God in the temple and present sacrifices there. At least once a year. So while they were on the journey, they would often sing songs to help kind of pass the time by. And as we've been learning, the book of Psalms is kind of a songbook. And so they had a handful of psalms that they would go to to sing to pass the time by on their trip to Jerusalem. And Psalm 84 is one of those songs that they would go to to sing as they made the trip from wherever they were to Jerusalem to worship God in the temple. So with that in mind, let's take a look at this psalm. I'm going to kind of preach through this exegetically, verse by verse, and I'm going to give you the outline right up front so you can kind of follow along. The psalm is 12 verses long, broken up into three sections. The first four verses really talk about a longing for church. Then the next few verses talk about actually traveling to the temple or to church. And then the last three verses are about the fulfillment and the joy that comes when you finally arrive at church. So let's begin right up front. Number one, there is a longing for church. The first four verses reveal a longing to be in God's house. Let's look at what the psalmist writes. He says, how lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. Listen to these words he uses to describe how much he longs to be in God's house. My soul yearns, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Now the word soul in the Hebrew original language is the word for your innermost being. So the psalmist is saying from the depths of who I am, everything about me, even my flesh and my heart, cry out for the living God. That's how badly I wanna be in church and and experience his presence. The word cry there uh, has this picture of a baby that cries when it's hungry. And I'm sure you've seen an infant cry when it's hungry. They cry with their whole body, right? Their, their fists clench, they, they kick their legs up and down, they, they scrunch their faces, they cry to be heard, to be fed. My question to you today is, 
Do you have that same intense of a longing and a yearning to be in God's house? Do you desire with everything in you to be in church worshiping the living God? The writer of the psalm, as I said, only gets to worship in the temple maybe once or a couple times a year. And so he's excited to the point of yearning and longing, even fainting to worship God again. And this is, for me personally, how I think we should be too. I think, I think we should be like, man, I, I can't wait for Sunday. What day is it? Is it Monday? Oh my gosh, six more days to go. It's Wednesday. We're, we're getting over the hump. I can't wait for church. I can't wait to worship. I can't wait to be with my people. I can't wait to see what God's going to do. I think that should be our disposition and our, and our attitude for church. Because this is where we experience his presence. Now, wherever you are on your excitement level, hopefully If you're not there, you have a desire to actually want to increase that sense of longing for church, for God. But let me look at verse three as we continue on. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself where she may have her young. A place near your altar, Lord Almighty, my King and my God. What the psalmist here is is basically doing, remember, this is a song and it's a book of poetry. He's expressing jealousy, in essence, for the birds who get to, who are allowed to make their nests in and around the temple buildings. And so he's like, man, the birds literally get to, they make their nests and and they get to be in in the temple and in, in God's presence all day, every day. I wish I could be like the birds who got to just, Be there and see everything that happens. The birds felt safe to build their nest there, indicating that God's house and church should be an inviting place of safety, not a place that we should be afraid of. And these birds, it says, had their young in these nests, indicating that God's house is a great place to bring and raise your children in. And where did it say that their nests were? It said, near your altar, O Lord the place where sacrifices were regularly made to atone for sin. And so it's in church that we and our children are regularly reminded of the sacrifice that Jesus made to pay the price for our sins so that we could be restored to a relationship with our Heavenly Father. I don't know if you long to be in God's house the same way the writer of this psalm does. If not, maybe it's because your past experience has shown you that church isn't a safe place. And if that's been your experience, I'm sorry. Or maybe you're not there from an excitement level because we need to have our perspective shifted a little bit about the sin that has separated us from God and the sacrifice that was required to make it possible for us to be restored to a relationship with our Heavenly Father. At the end of this verse, he addresses God two ways, Lord Almighty and my King and my God. Now first, Lord Almighty, or as some translations say, Lord of hosts or Lord of armies, means the Lord of multitudes, the Lord of many, the awesome power who controls angel armies. So that's the one title. And then on the other hand, he says, my King and my God, which is a personal relationship. Not only is he the God of angel armies and the God of hosts and multitudes and many, he is my king. He's my God through my relationship with Jesus Christ. And he goes on in verse four to describe someone else who gets to spend a lot of time in the temple. First it was the birds and now he says, blessed are those who dwell in your house for they are ever praising you. So the psalmist goes from envying the birds who get to make their nests in the temple to envying the priests and the temple officials who had rooms in the temple and literally got to live there to worship God all day, every day, or so the psalmist thought. And I find a lot of times when I talk to people um, that that's what they think pastors do all day, every day. Man, you must have the best job in the world. You just get to read your Bible and pray and and worship God all day, every day. Like, hey, can we get together? You're not doing it because like you only work on Sundays, right? So you must have a lot of flexibility during the week. Literally, some people think that. I hope you know that 
being in ministry, I, I love being a pastor. I love how much I get to think about God and think about his work and think about his people and think about how we can better be a representation of Jesus to our world and our community. But man, it's hard work. It's the hardest job I've ever had in my life. And so I hope you realize that it's not just sitting in church all day, every day, worshiping God, singing Kumbaya. But the point here is that the psalmist's dream is to live in the house of God and be forever praising him. How many of you feel that way like the psalmist does? How many of you look at coming to church as an opportunity to worship rather than just checking a box to fulfill a religious obligation for the week? How many of us joyfully long to worship in the temple as often as we possibly can? I find that too often it's the exact opposite for a lot of people where we're kind of like half-hearted in our desire and commitment to come to church and we'll use any excuse, the most convenient excuse to not come. Oh, it's gonna be 80 degrees outside, it's gonna be a beautiful day. I need to do some yard work. I wanna go to the beach, I, I, don't, have, I don't have time, I'll go next week. Or the opposite end, it's, it's raining out today, I don't feel like going out. So whether it's nice or it's crappy outside, it's like a convenient excuse to not come to church. My kids got this thing going on with their sports. And so we're not, we're not excited about being here and any convenient excuse that pops up, we take it. And even when we do come, we're not necessarily, you know, intentional about making sure that we are here before service begins so that we can participate in every single song of worship. I am blown away every single week without fail when service begins, I'm on the front row here, I look back, I get a sense for how many people in the room, and then worship is over, and I come on the stage, I'm like, oh, it's the multiplication of the loaves and fishes. There's so many more people here. It boggles my mind. I have no idea why you would ever want to miss a single opportunity to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who gave his life for you. I'll just stop there. <laughs> the psalmist is describing a longing to be in church, worshiping God. Oh, that God would give us the same longing for his house again. So that's the first four verses, just a longing to be in church. There's a transition in verse five that begins the journey to the temple. Wherever the psalmist lived, there was a pilgrimage that was required to travel to Jerusalem so I could finally be there and worship. Traveling to church, verses five through nine. In the second section of the psalm, the writer realizes is that as much as he would like to be there all day, every day in the temple praising God, it's just not realistic for him. Yeah, the birds can do it, but they don't have a job. Yeah, the priests can do it, but that is their job. He has a job and therefore he can't be there all day, every day. He's got to go to work, provide for his family like so many of us do. But even still, all these other things that he has the responsibility to do are secondary to his desire to be at church worshiping God. And so in verses five through nine, he begins to say, well, if I can't live there, at least I get to go there once or twice a year. Verse five, he says, blessed are those whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage, the journey begins. In other words, blessed is the man whose heart is set on traveling to God's house as frequently as he can where he is strengthened in God's presence. Blessed is the man whose highlight of the week is when he gets to go to church to worship. Blessed is the man who does not rely on himself or anything in this world for strength, but considers himself a visitor, a traveler, a pilgrim, if you will, in this world whose true strength is found in God alone. The strength and heart of a pilgrim are displayed by the love that he or she has for the house of God. It's here that we meet with God along with other pilgrims and gain strength in God together as we meet the love and longing, listen to me, for the house of God is not meant to be an escape from the world, but preparation for living in the world. This is where God fills us up. This is where we're instructed in righteousness. This is where we're you know, convicted and corrected from our wrong ways of thinking. 
This is where we're equipped to be sent out to live on mission. We gather and we scatter. We gather to scatter. It's not an escape from the big bad world out there. This is where we're equipped and prepared to live as representatives and ambassadors of a different kingdom. Where do you draw your strength from? Some people look inward. I'm gonna draw the strength from inside. Some people look to money. Some people look to status. Some people look to family. And listen, some of those things are not bad, but what is your heart set on? He says, blessed is the man whose heart is set on pilgrimage, on journeying and traveling, no matter how dangerous the road is, to be in God's presence. What is your heart set on chasing after to find fulfillment? Is it a a hobby? Hunting, fishing, shopping? Is it making a big sale at work or making as much money as you possibly can? Is it spending time with your family? Again, none of these things are bad in and of themselves, but none of them will satisfy you like worshiping God will. We are created to worship and you will never find total fulfillment in life apart from knowing that your life was meant to give glory to him. And if you're not getting fulfilled by worshiping God in church, then you will turn to other things to find fulfillment and those other things will never satisfy you. I pray almost every single night over my boys at 11 and 13, when they go to bed, they still, my youngest especially, will say, hey dad, can you pray for us? I love that they're still asking me to pray for them. And every single night, almost without fail, at some point in my prayer, I will repeat these words. Lord, stir spiritual hunger in their hearts. Give them a hunger for your word and a passion for your presence. I'm basically praying, God, stir hunger in them that they will spend their days passionately pursuing your presence, that they would love you and your church. I know we're all at different places on our pilgrimage through life, on our spiritual journey, if you will, but I pray that your heart is set on pursuing until you find and experience the fulfillment that comes when you worship the one true God. That's what pilgrimage is. It's a journey. And the psalmist in the next verse mentions one of the places he has to travel through in his journey on his way to Jerusalem. Verse six, as they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The autumn rains also cover it with pools. Now, when I looked into this, there's a lot of debate amongst commentators and scholars. They don't, we're not really sure exactly where the Valley of Baca was in ancient Israel, but most scholars agree that it was an arid valley that developed pools during the rainy seasons. And because Baca is a noun that's derived from a verb that means to weep, a lot of commentators suggest that Baca means or is symbolic of crying or tears or weeping or drought and dryness. In either case, it's an implication that this is about affliction and hardship or difficulty. But it's the psalmist's anticipated joy of eventually arriving in Jerusalem where he can worship in the temple that he's able to turn this dry, arid place into a spring of pools where he can be refreshed. Because God sends rain for them to be able to refresh their animals and and take a rest on their way to Jerusalem to be refreshed. And as a result, in verse seven, they go from strength to strength until each appears before God in Zion. Zion means holy city. It was referring to to Jerusalem where the temple was. For all of us, we are all on a journey going through life. And on this journey, we're gonna pass through some dry seasons. We're gonna pass through some desert places. We're gonna go through some things that make us cry and weep, some hardships. And when people feel dry and empty, it's been my experience that that's often when they decide, you know what, I don't really feel like going to church. There's too much going on in my life. It's too hard. I just, I just need to do something for myself. I just need to stay home and kick back and relax. But these dry times in our life, can I tell you, are when we need to be in church the most. If you stay away from God, you will only get drier and drier and drier. But the psalmist whose heart is set on a journey remembers that his journey is gonna end somewhere. He's gonna eventually make it to the temple where he's gonna be able to worship God and experience his presence. 
And so he's able to turn the valley of tears into a refreshing place of springs. I kind of picture it like this. So we're all kind of on a journey, right? And we recognize, I hope you realize that this world is not our home. Okay, we were made for eternity. We are exiles in Babylon, if you will. Okay? And in fact, Paul kind of echoes what what the psalmist says here. In 2 Corinthians, I believe it's 5.10, he says, we will each appear before the judgment seat of Christ. So one day we will appear before God in Zion, in the holy city. But until then, sometimes doesn't it feel like all of life is one big valley of Baca? Like just tomorrow's Monday. Oh, I gotta go to work. Baca. Tuesday, I hate my job. I hate my boss. I hate my coworkers. Baca. Wednesday, my kids are rebelling, running from God. Baca. Thursday, mom's sick. I don't know how the diagnosis is gonna end. Baca. And it's just like one thing after another as we travel through life, these seasons of struggle. I need something to refresh and strengthen my soul. But guess what's coming? Sunday's coming. I get to be in church. I get to experience his presence. And when I get there, he pours out his spirit like rain. And I drink in the worship. I drink in the prayer. I drink in the preaching of his word. I drink in the encouragement and fellowship of his people. And I am refreshed. And I am strengthened. Blessed are those whose strength is in you. I'm strengthened to go back out into the valley of Baca. And it says we go from strength to strength. So it's like, okay, I gotta go back to work tomorrow. I'm back to Baca. I'm back to all the hardships. I, I get an escape from it here for a little while where I get to like forget about it and just fix my gaze on Jesus. But eventually I gotta go back out and face it. But I go from strength to strength to strength to strength from Sunday to Sunday to Sunday to Sunday where I'm refreshed and renewed and strengthened in his presence. When you feel spiritually dry, don't stop coming to church. I put it this way. Attending service to service moves you from strength to strength as you walk through seasons of struggle. You all know my affinity for alliteration. Attending service to service moves you from strength to strength as you go through seasons of struggle. Like rest stops on the road of life. Verses eight and nine conclude this section of the psalm with a prayer. He says, hear my prayer, Lord God Almighty. Listen to me, God of Jacob. Look on our shield, O God. Look with favor on your anointed one. This prayer is almost like a parenthesis that kind of interrupts the flow of the psalm. But it shows us basically that prayer is the means of laying hold of his strength in our weakness as we go through the Valley of Baca. There's a lot more that I wish I had time to unpack in this little two-sentence prayer, but there's more I want to show you in the rest of the psalm. So the first nine verses are about a longing to be in God's house, followed by an arduous journey through the Valley of Baca to be strengthened in God's presence, the journey, the pilgrimage, traveling to church. Then number three, we finally arrive at church. Verses 10 through 12. And verse 10 is the climax of the psalm and one of my favorite verses in the entire Bible. The psalmist writes, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. The psalmist finally arrives in Jerusalem and realizes that even though he can't stay long, even though he's got to go back to wherever he lives. He gets to spend at least one day, and better is one day in your house, oh God, than a thousand anywhere else. How many of you feel that way? Some of you do. You know, I think about, I used to think like, man, wouldn't it be nice if I just, if I had a place on, in Hawaii? What's your dream vacation? Think about it. Like, man, wouldn't it be nice to just, Drink from coconuts all day, every day, and relax on the beach and read and not worry about anything. It might be nice for a little while, but how fulfilled would you be if you never got to worship God in the temple again? 
if you never got to go to church and experience his presence, if you never got to experience community or witness life change, I, and I don't know about you, but I wouldn't be fulfilled very long. One day in church, worshiping God and experiencing his presence with his people and seeing lives changed is better than a thousand days anywhere else doing anything else. And when church is the way God wants it to be, church is the best possible place to be. In fact, look at what the psalmist says next. After he says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere, he says, I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. So he lists two ends of the spectrum here. First is the doorkeeper in the temple. The doorkeeper was basically a greeter who stood at the door welcoming people who were coming to the temple to worship. It was a volunteer position and likely the lowest volunteer position anybody could have in the temple. And then on the other end of the spectrum, he says, those who dwell in the tents of the wicked. The word dwell and tents both indicate a lavish, lavish, rich life in the lap of luxury and ease. Having more money than you know what to do with, having people wait on you hand and foot. And so basically the psalmist is comparing and contrasting the lowest volunteer position in the temple with the highest position in the world. And which does he prefer? He prefers the lowest position in the temple. Isn't that amazing? What would you choose if God came to you tomorrow and said, okay, you can be Elon Musk or you can be the greeter at the church. Which do you want? It's a tough question, isn't it? (laughs) But when you think about it, even though it's completely opposite of the way the world thinks, it makes sense, doesn't it? Because what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his own soul? You can have everything in life, but if if I don't have Jesus, I've got nothing. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God and be close to his presence, be able to experience his, his worship and all that he does than have everything that the world has to offer. This echoes what the Apostle Paul writes in his letter to the Philippians. He says this, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness or value of knowing Christ Jesus as my Lord. You guys, I love church because church is where I experience the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus as my Lord. I love church because I get to worship Jesus with my brothers and sisters, with my church family. I love church because this is where he speaks to us through his word and where he strengthens us. I love church because church is where I experience Jesus' presence through his people. I love church because miracles happen here. This morning as I had come into church early, my wife texted me an encouragement. And she goes, I saw this on Instagram and I just wanted to encourage you with it. And I sent it to our tech team and said, hey, would you add this to my notes this morning? I want to share this with the church. Louis Giglio is the, is the pastor at Passion City Church in Atlanta, Georgia. And this is what he posted about the church. Let me read it to you. He says, church is where Jesus is at the center. Hope is alive. Spirits moving. The city is served. The word is proclaimed. Grace is extended. Miracles happen. People united. The cross raised. Self is absorbed by a greater story. Value is spoken. Praise resounding. Destinies changed. Broken are mended. The unexpected is expected. The shattered are restored. Believers are strengthened. The lost is found. And the dead are made alive. Let me ask you again, where else would you rather be than right here, right now? That's the church. That's the body of Christ. I love the church. I love my church because I'm overwhelmed when I look across this room and I see the number of blue shirts. Some of you are wearing orange shirts, are helping hands ministry in the kid's life, wear orange shirts. Our dream team is what we call them a.k.a. doorkeepers that are opening the door for other people to come in and experience the presence of God that changed their life. In fact, I want to share with you today some stories of people who are here today in part 
because of some of our doorkeepers, because of some of our dream team members. So I've asked a couple of people to help share their story a little bit. I'm going to start right here on the front row. Would you stand, please? Share with everyone your name first. Hi, I'm Shekinah. I serve on the Next Steps team. Awesome, Shekinah. Thanks for being willing to share your story with us. Would you share with your church family what your experience was like when you first walked through the doors of Life Church? How long ago was that first? Um, last year. Last year? Last year? Okay. And what were you feeling when you made the decision to come here for the first time? Um, so I was looking for a church because um, we were just out of quarantine from COVID. Um, our country had went through a lot of political discord. So uh, when I discovered Life Church, which I didn't tell you, Pete, the first thing that drew me was the kids' ministry um, online. Um, being a single mom, being able to serve was really the, the heart of choosing to come here. Um, and so when I found Life Church, I realized that it was in a predominantly white area. And because we just went through everything with our country, I was a little bit nervous. Uh, you know, the enemy gets in your ear. So I had a lot of anxiety driving up the driveway. But um, the, the people in, out in the, the parking lot uh, started waving at me. So my anxiety started to lift, and they were smiling at me. And then when I walked, when I parked in the back and I walked up the pavement to come into the building, the door greeters were very excited to see me. And I'm just like, what is this? And then I walked into the uh, foyer out there. And the Next Steps team at the time was staring me down and smiling at me. And I'm like, um, is this real? Um, but I felt very welcomed, and I sensed the spirit of joy immediately in the place. So. That's awesome. And if I remember your story, Shekinah, correctly, you had almost, like, the anxiety was so high that you almost, as you were walking in, were about to turn around and leave. But it was somebody's eye contact with you that kind of kept you, gave you the courage yeah. to keep coming, right? Yeah, um, just the constant smiling and the eye contact and the welcomingness of... Uh, Everyone who volunteered, it started out in the parking lot, went to the door with the people, the greeters, and then the Next Steps team, every step of the way, wow. the volunteers made eye contact with me, smiled, and it, it really kept me. So it was like uh, virtual hugs, you know, with the eyes, awesome. and that really, you know, captivated me. And now Shekinah is a team leader on our Next Steps team. <laughs> that is awesome. Thank you so much, Shekinah. All because our parking lot attendants, our doorkeepers out in the parking lot, opened the door and made eye contact. And listen, greeters, you never know what just making eye contact with someone coming in can do to give them the courage to actually come in. One more story I want to share with you guys today, and it's from this couple over here. This is Katerina and Alexi. Did I pronounce that correctly? Yes, that's correct. Okay. So you guys are from Russia. And you left Russia when the war with Ukraine started, correct? Yes. And you wound up in Turkey, right? Yes. And you were looking to try to come to Canada at first because why were you looking at Canada? My mom lives there and we were trying to get a work visa. And first company said that they're going to hire me. But several months later, while we were waiting for documents, they declined it. Okay. And we were lost, like what to do. Gotcha. So they're in Turkey. The door to Canada closes. And so they find a church, from what I understand, that is somewhat similar to our church. And they were listening to the pastor preach one Sunday, and he mentioned the United States of America in his message. And that prompted you guys to start searching for a place in America, but that was close to the Canadian border that might be able to give you one day access to get to see your mom. Tell the people what you found while you were searching Google for places in America close to the Canadian border? <laughs> well, first of all, I want to thank uh, everyone on the tech team uh, who does YouTube, because if not YouTube, we would probably never find your church. And, uh, <laughs> and second of all, as well, I didn't say that before, we found out that you guys have a great kids team. Like, I mean, Kids' life is amazing for our son because he's in sensory room, and this is really rare in churches here. And um, uh, we were looking for the place, and we found YouTube channel, and uh, we were watching your preaching, and it was amazing as today, as always, and I was just crying, and we realized that that's the place wow. that we had got to go here. <laughs> so living... This is a home. Yeah. This is home. <laughs> so check this out. 
They're in Turkey and stumble across our church's YouTube channel while they're looking for places in America that are close to the Canadian border. And so somebody tells them about a possible way to come to America by way of Mexico. So they make the very difficult decision and take a leap of faith to move their family and their little one to Mexico in the hopes that the door will open for them to legally enter the country and come to America. And so they were in Turkey for, it was about nine months last year from March to November, right? And then you were in Mexico for about four months waiting for something to happen and laws to change so that they could come. And you were one of, what, about 800 people at the border? We were waiting with another 800 people due to the change of the laws with the administration of United States Mm -hmm. about uh, people coming in and the legal ways of doing that, like through Custom Border Patrol people. We were waiting to get our appointment with them, not to jump over the fence or anything, (laughs) you know, like doing legal stuff. So meanwhile, they're still watching Life Church Buffalo on YouTube almost every week, okay? And somebody comes and prays for them while they're in Mexico and almost prophesies over them saying, I believe that God is going to open the doors just like he opened the seas of the Red Sea to allow the Israelites and Moses to cross over. You're going to be able to come to America. And what happened just a couple weeks later? And then we actually catch the date on the 8th of February. We were able to go to the Custom Border Patrol people from uh, Matamoros to Brownsville, Texas. Wow. And we did it. So on February 8th, they were the first one out of the 800 people they were with to cross the border and legally enter the United States of America. How awesome is that? (laughs) So they hop on a train, travel from San Antonio to Chicago, right? Then another train from Chicago to Buffalo, where the following Sunday you would walk through these doors right here. Yes, that was amazing. It was like a dream come true because it was like you're watching something on YouTube and you cannot believe that it actually will happen. You just pray and you hope and that's it. And then you're like, wow. (laughs) And two months later, your husband got got baptized baptized right here. (laughs) One more question. Can you share with the church the impact that our Blue Shirt Dream Team has had on your faith since you've been here? Well, you guys have become our family because we found our best friends here. Actually, the very first day when we came here, uh, we went with Teddy to Sensory Room, and that's where we met Joy Burger and her family, who are, have become ever since our best friends. And she heard our story, and I couldn't believe that the person who I'm meeting for the first time was crying. Wow. And it was just so touching. And ever since, we've been friends, and for the rest of you guys, you've been so helpful, and we're really thankful. It's home. That's awesome. Thank you guys for sharing your story. Let's give it up for them. All because some doorkeepers operating cameras like Brian right here on the front row, sitting behind computer stations up in the control room that enable us to stream. (laughs) They're here. That was them letting you know, yeah, that's us. All because some doorkeepers made it possible for us to stream our services onto the World Wide Web where somebody halfway around the world can find us and say, you know what, maybe we can get there. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. Here's what's awesome about being a doorkeeper in God's house. You get to be a part of stories like that. I'm praying that some of you today would look inward and say, you know what? I've been coming long enough. It's time for me to get off the sidelines and into the game. Because here's what I know, Christianity is not a spectator sport. Christians are not consumers. We're contributors. Jesus said, I didn't come to be served, but to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. And we're called to follow in his footsteps. So we don't, I hope you realize that if you're a believer, you don't just go to church. 
You, we actually are the church and we exist for the world. We're intended to, God's desire and plan for your life is to use the gifts and talents he has given you to open the door for other people to come to the table and taste and see how good God is. I love my church. I love all of you. I love what God is doing in this church and I love how he's growing this church. If you've been coming for longer than a few months, then you've seen each week the room getting fuller and fuller. Last year around this time, we were averaging somewhere around 800 people a weekend. Right now, we're averaging about 950 people a weekend. And before the summer hit, we actually had six weekends where we had you know, surpassed the thousand barrier. And you know if you were here in those services, anytime this room gets more than 400 people in it, it starts to feel a little bit tight, Right? And I love that. I love that God is continuing to draw more and more people here, that you are inviting your friends and family. But here's what we know. Like if history is any indicator, which it is, every single year we can look at the trends of when, you know, our attendance numbers dip and when they go up. And the fall in September, after people go back to school, we see our attendance growth curve just kind of hockey stick. It just shoots right up. And so in preparation for the growth that we know is coming, that God is going to continue to bring more people, we need to make more room. So I'm really excited to announce to you guys today that starting on September 10th, we are adding a third service so that there is more room for more people to experience God's presence and what he's doing here at Life Church Buffalo. Service times, as you can see on the screen, are going to be 8, 9.30, and 11.15. And here's what I would ask you guys as you're considering which service you're gonna attend. If you have the flexibility and the ability to choose and and be flexible, could I ask you to consider maybe the eight o'clock or the 1115 service? Because what we know about that middle time slot is that's the most desirable time for people who are new to church, who are thinking about, hey, do I wanna go to church? That's the time they're gonna come. And so when they come, we wanna make sure that there's enough room for those visitors and guests to come. So I would just ask you to prayerfully consider if you have the flexibility to consider the 8 or the 1115 service. But with this move to three services, there's also the need to grow our dream team, our doorkeepers. A lot of people, especially if you're new to church, you see the number of volunteers we have and you're like, wow, man, they got, they're a well-oiled machine. They must, they don't, they don't need me. They've got everything covered. <laughs> that is not the case. There are dozens, literally probably close to 140 positions available across these three services. And I'm going to challenge every single person in the room today who is not currently serving on the dream team to consider changing that. Today is Dream Team Sunday. And that's why you see me, our worship team, and so many of our people wearing these blue t-shirts because we're highlighting the doorkeepers of our church that are literally opening the door, making it possible for people to experience God's presence and be transformed by the grace of Jesus. And so after service lets out in a few minutes, I wanna encourage you to not leave before you stop in the foyer and talk to some members of different teams we have posted out there that would love to chat with you and answer any questions you might have about what it looks like to serve in their area of ministry. We need doorkeepers in kids' ministry, in kids' life. Maybe you've got a heart for little ones. Do you want to open the door to make it possible for our youngest ones to experience Jesus at their level? We need ushers to literally usher people into the presence of God, help them find their seats. Because as I've mentioned, a lot of times people are showing up in the middle of worship and it can be a little bit tricky and challenging to try to find a seat when the room is so full and everyone's standing We need parkers. You heard from Shekinah the impact that our parkers had on her courage to come to church when she was feeling very anxious. Every single member of our dream team is a doorkeeper. And I love that I'm a part of a church that has so many people who'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of God, worshiping Jesus, serving and loving his people, than living it up out there in the world. I love my church. I hope you love your church. 
We have needs on the tech team. Maybe, you know, you're a little bit more introverted and you'd rather be up in a control room and, you know, not have to talk to so many people. I made a joke in the first service and I caught flack from them after the first service because I said, yeah, they don't talk to each other at all during the entire service. And they're like, hey, wait, we're introverted, but we're, we talk to each other. <laughs> Wherever your gifts and talents are, I know that God has put those in you for a reason. You're a part of the body of Christ. And God wants to use you to make an impact in the life of someone else. I don't have time to go into the last two verses of the Psalm. So I'm just gonna close it with this. Here's what I know will happen if you make the decision to step outside your comfort zone and sign up to join the dream team. Here's what I know of your experience and your excitement about church is gonna change. If you think you enjoy church now, wait till you get a front row seat to the stories of life change. Wait till you witness how God uses you to be a part of someone else's story. I'm telling you what, if you think you enjoy church now, you ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, you will be forever spoiled on just attending church as normal because there is nothing like letting God use you to help open the door for somebody to come in and experience the presence of Jesus, be forgiven of their sins, be given a new lease on life, be restored to hope and, and purpose and destiny. Man, that's where it's at. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than dwell in the tents of the wicked. And if you decide to step up and serve on the dream team, you're gonna show up every week and just like Marv Levy say, where else would you rather be than right here, right now? One person's excited about that. <laughs> Let me pray for us. Jesus, we love you. We love your word because it's what speaks to us, it's how you strengthen us. God, we love your people. I love this group of people so much. Thank you for calling me to be their pastor. God, I pray that if we are not at a place in our journey of being excited about coming to church, God, I pray just like I do for my boys every night that you would stir spiritual hunger in us, that we would look forward to Sunday that we would go from strength to strength to strength as we walk through the valley of Baca, knowing, God, that you have made us for a purpose. And part of our purpose is to worship you. And one of the ways we worship you is when we gather together with your church. The last two verses in the psalm as we're praying say that the Lord bestows favor and honor on us. And no good thing does he withhold from those whose walk is blameless. And the thing about that is, none of us are blameless. But you know who was? Jesus was. And when we trust in him, not only does he remove our sins from us, but he credits his perfect blameless life to us. And that is why God bestows favor and honor on us. Not because of anything good we've done, but because of how good God is. And he will not withhold any good thing from us. Blessed are those whose hope and trust is in the Lord. And so God, I pray for every person in this room, every person watching online. Lord, I pray for those who have not yet made the decision to surrender the control of their life to you. I pray, Lord, that they would come to find your house and your people as a safe place to discover that they are loved by the God of all creation and the one who knows their name, the number of hairs on their head. You have a plan and a purpose for their life. And God, I pray that you would reveal yourself to them in such a clear and real way. God, that they would be drawn to surrender their life to you. And for the rest of us who are already a part of the family, God, I pray that you would continue to increase our hunger and our longing to be in your house to spend our lives worshiping you, to be doorkeepers in your house, 
paving the way and opening the door for others to come in and experience the same transforming grace and love that set us free. That God, that you would use us to help facilitate an experience where others can taste and see how good you are. Lord, I pray that you would just call us out of our comfort zones. It's gonna be easy for some of us to just leave this service, maybe wanna scoot out the lobby before we even hit the foyer to avoid the awkward eye contact of not wanting to serve. But God, I just pray that you would just give us the courage to say, you know what, Lord, it's time for me to get involved. It's time for me to stop just consuming, but actually begin contributing to the mission of God to making this place what it is intended to be. A house where the name of Jesus is lifted high above all else and where the people of God become the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. As Paul wrote at the end of Ephesians 1, which is a mystery I can't quite wrap my head around. But it says that God appointed Jesus to be the head over everything and the head of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way that we, as the gathered people of God, become the fullness of God. See, what the psalmist wrote thousands of years ago was a precursor to the ultimate meeting place for us, which is Jesus. See, the temple for us in the New Testament, a thousand years after Psalm 84 was written, a guy would show up in Jerusalem where the temple was, and he says, destroy this temple, and I'll build it again in three days. And the Jewish leaders scoffed and said, it's taken us 46 years to build this, and you're going to raise it in three days? They didn't know that he was talking about his own body that would be destroyed by crucifixion and then raised to resurrection life three days later. And so now in the New Testament, as believers in Jesus, the temple is no longer this towering structure in Jerusalem. It's not a physical building that we have to go to to experience the presence of God. Every person who places their, places their faith and trust in Jesus becomes a living stone in a new spiritual temple, which is the body of Christ that God pours his presence into. And this becomes the arena that he pours out his spirit and shows us his glory. You're a part of the temple. You are the temple in which the spirit of God dwells. And I pray that your heart would respond with so much gratitude for what God has made possible for you through Jesus. That your heart would be the same as the psalmist who says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in my, in my God's house than live it up in the land of luxury in this world. God, I thank you for what you're building here. I thank you for my church. Lord, thank you for my brothers and sisters in Christ. God, continue to build us up in you that we would be a demonstration to those who are coming in hungry and thirsty and searching for answers. God, you are the answer. Use us to help people see that, God. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Well, church, I love you guys so much. I love my church. I hope you love your church as well. As our Dream Team members get into position to serve you with excellence on your way out, I just wanna encourage you one more time, please don't leave today without stopping by the foyer and talking to our Dream Team members, talking to some of the teams that you might be interested in stepping up to serve on. They would love to answer any questions you have. But we got one more week for Psalms, so I hope you come back next week. I love you so much, church. I hope you have a great week. We'll see you next Sunday. God bless.